today's presentation is care during the late gestation. Uh, uh, okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, so this slide, uh, I'm showing the nutritional uh, requirement of the pregnant animal during the late pregnancy. Uh, so uh, during day 120 to 150, um, nutritional requirement of the pregnant animal is high. Uh, uh, so that is the time period when lambs or kids, their maximum growth occurs. The fetus's maximum growth occurs um, from 120 to 150 days, immediately before uh, birth. So that four to six weeks of window, last four to six window period, is the maximum growth of the fetuses occurs. And uh, the nutrition of the pregnant animal that determines the weight, birth weight of the fetuses. If the birth weight is less, if the nutrition of the pregnant animal is low, the birth weight will be less. If the birth weight will be less, then um, especially for those twins and triplets, those will be less likely to survive if the nutrition of the uh, pregnant animal is less during that window. So nutrition during 120 to 150 days is the most important one. Um, so day zero is the day when the breeding occurred. Day 150 is the average day when most of the lambs are most of the pregnant animals, the lamb or kid. That is the gestation period. Uh, this slide uh, contains some of the research conclusion uh, of the research that was done back in 1980s and 1990s in Australia. The results presented here might be a little bit extreme, but these results still applies. So what we are trying to show here is pregnant animals body condition score that will determine lamb survival. So whether lamb or kid will survive or not, that depends upon pregnant animals body condition score immediately before kidding or lambing. So in the um, so this study was done in Victoria state of Australia. What they have found is a body condition score of 2.2. The survival of the singles, survivals of the singles burn were 74%. If the body condition score is a little bit high, like 3.1, then the survival of the singles is 86%. So if the body condition score is high, survivals of the singles will be higher. Similar is the case for the twins. Uh, pregnant animals with a body condition score of 2.2, the survival of the twins was 38%. Whereas if the pregnant animal has a body condition score of 3.1, then the survivals of the twins will be 56%. So we are trying to see trying to show pregnant animals body condition score immediately before lambing or kidding. If they have higher body condition score, chances of survival is more, both in singles and twins, and twins are more affected than the singles. Similar is the case for, uh, similar is the case for uh, Western Australia. This again, this research was done in 1970s, 80s with a, like a data collected from 500 uh, uh, pregnant animals and um, in merino sheep uh, in a free range. So the results presented here may be a little bit extreme, but we will see similar situation in our lambs and uh, in our uh, sheep and goat. So in Western Australia, a pregnant animal with a body condition score of 
uh, with the singles, their survival percentage was 81%. Twins, 58% survival rate. And again, with higher body condition score like 3.5, their singles will survive 91, 92%, and twins' survival was 82%. In both of those research, what we have seen is chances of survival is more if body condition score is high and chances of survival is less if the body condition score is less. Um, again, I will uh, take one question from the chat box. Obese dams are more likely to have ketosis issue. Do lambs and uh, do lambs survive also decline from obese animals? Uh, so that's the right question. One of the most important thing is we want to stay between three and four body condition score. So we don't want to go more than four body condition score during lambing or kidding. Our main goal is we will try to stay between three and four body condition score. Do you want for me to go to the poll? Uh, uh, one or two more slides. Okay. Um, so this slide is the continuation of the previous slide. Again, uh, this slide shows the body condition score of the pregnant ewe at lambing and the chance of survival of the lamb. So what we have seen is body condition score in the x-axis that will start from one to five and chance of survival of the newborn lamb was from 40 to 100. Again, this study was conducted in Australia back in 70s and 80s in Merino sheep. These are old sheep with a little bit uh, bigger than our Katadin sheep. So what we have seen is with the singles, their chance of survival if the body condition score was 1.5 was 85%. So if they carry singles, it will not be that bad. They will survive uh, high chance. They will have still have 85 to 90% survival rate. Uh, but if the body condition is low and if they are carrying twins, their survivability is like 40% if they have 1.5 body condition score. Uh, around four, their chance of survival is 80%. So, Twins are more affected than singles if the body condition of you during lambing is low. So this is again uh, similar to the previous one. Uh, lamb survival is on the y-axis and the birth weight of the newborn lamb is in the x-axis. Again, these are the conclusions from the Merino sheep in Australia grown in free range and they are more affected if they have twins with a body condition score of low. Low body condition score, sorry, uh, let me back up that one. If the birth weight of the newly born lamb is around two kilograms, chance of survival of that lamb is less. <coughs> sorry. So two things. Nutrition less during the last 120 to 150 days. Lower would be the body weight of the newborn lamb. Lower the body weight of the newborn lamb, chance of survival is less. So that is the conclusion from these last two, three slides. In this uh, slide, in X axis, we have seen the body condition, sorry, we, in the X axis, we have seen the weight of the newborn lamb. And in y-axis, we have seen the chance of survival of the lamb. If the lamb are born as low, low weight, like two kilograms, their chance of survival is 20%. If they are born as six kilograms, their chance of survival is 95%. So higher weight lambs or kids, their chance of survival is higher. This applies in good also. So that is the conclusion of these three or four uh, slides. Uh, Dr. Salinas, do you want to go for a quiz? Paul? Dr. Salinas? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. I go. Sure.
Now you have a poll over there, so question. I think we have most of the most of the people. Do you want to See, comment? No? Sure. Um, so uh, it might be a little bit confusing, but uh, the answer is all of the above. Uh, the first is growth of the fetus increases rapidly during uh, late pregnancy. That is correct. Uh, what uh, 120 to 150 days. That's a true. The second is uh, smaller the lambs born as twins or triplets are less likely to survive. That is right. The third is lamb survival is affected by body condition score of the U8 lambing. That is also true. So the answer is all of the above. Yeah, I was telling Dr. Acharya that I don't like that question, that kind of questions because I always have the doubt if it's the last one or any of the others. Anyway. Okay, so, so this slide shows the nutritional requirement for a pregnant animal. Here we are looking at 160 pound female ewe. So what happens is, this is a, the last three lines are the nutritional requirement for the <coughs> pregnant animal during uh, last 120 to 150 days. The first row, U8 maintenance, that is the dry U, that is a maintenance, dry period, non-pregnant period. So 160 pound U8 maintenance needs 1.6% of the body weight as a feed. So we need to feed 1.6% body weight of body weight of that animal. That is a total dry matter that comes 2.8 pound of dry matter per day per animal. That includes grain plus hay plus forage they graze. So everything, all the things that you feed to that animal, that is 2.8 pound per day per animal if they are non-pregnant. The crude protein for that would be 0.19 and the total digestible nutrient that is energy requirement for that animal will be 1.3 pound. See that last three rows, use carrying single lamp, carrying twins and carrying triplets. All they get like 2.5% of the body weight except the third one carrying triplets or more, 2.8% of the body weight. So the dry matter they are getting is pretty much around 2.5% body weight and they are getting, they need to get four pound dry matter per day. That can be either grain or hay or forest. But the most important thing you need to consider is the crude protein for the maintenance is 0.19. That is 7.5% crude protein. But use carrying singles, female sheep carrying singles, they need to get 0 0.45 pound crude protein. And see how that crude protein requirement increases with the twins and increases with the triplets. So, so the crude protein with the singles is 86%, 8.6%, twins 10.5%, and triplets 11.5%. So the crude protein need to be increased though you are feeding similar amount of dry matter. For that, you need to feed high quality forage or you need to grade, graze in a pasture that contains high crude protein or high quality hay or you need to feed grain. So that crude protein requirement need to be met. And total digestible uh, nutrient, that's the energy requirement. See how uh, that energy requirement changes from maintenance to those carrying triplets. So you are feeding 1.3 uh, 
pound dry matter for the maintenance, whereas you are feeding 3.3 pound of dry matter for the pregnant animal carrying triplets. So energy requirement, protein requirement, everything increases sharply if they are carrying singles, twins or triplets. That's the most important thing uh, take away from this slide. So dry, total dry matter increases, crude protein, crude protein requirement increases, crude protein percentage increases, and the total digestible nutrient you need to feed high quality forest in order to meet all these requirements. So all the everybody would ask how much grain should I feed? Um, that is the one of the uh, important question that I always get. So uh, if you are expecting uh, 130 to 150 percent lambing, that means if your animals, uh, if you are expecting mostly singles and few twins, then you need to feed one, you need to feed half to one pound of grain per animal per day. And you need to start feeding at least four to six weeks before lambing. But if you are expecting mostly twins and some triplets, you need to feed one to two pound grain per animal per day. And you need to start feeding at least six weeks before lambing. So the nutritional requirement, the amount of grain, that is just for the amount of grain that you will be feeding to the pregnant animal before lambing or kidding. Uh, so after nutrition, after crude protein and energy, calcium and phosphorus are the two most important things. It maintenance during the dry period, sheep just need 2.8 pound of dry matter per day and the calcium is 2.5 gram, phosphorus is 2.4 gram. But see, during the last four to six weeks of gestation, if you are expecting 130 to 150 lambing rate, that means if you are expecting either singles or few twins, then the dry matter increases, requirement for the calcium also increases sharply. Like you need to double or maybe triple, at least double uh, the calcium requirement you are feeding during the dry period. If you are expecting triplets, you need to increase the calcium requirement. So during the last four to six weeks of pregnancy, if you are expecting twins or tripl uh, singles twins or triplets, calcium and phosphorus will be exactly the double than you are feeding during a dry period, during the maintenance period. Uh, I have provided link under that. Uh, that was the uh, chart that I took from Montana University and it it's a very important uh, detail is written there if you want to uh, see that uh, article in detail. So all I have uh, discussed so far is the nutritional requirement of the animal. Um, next few slides will be complications like uh, what are the problems that you might encounter if those nutritions are not made during that uh, time period, like uh, from 120 until 150 days of gestation, that last 46 weeks, if, you, if the nutritional requirement of the pregnant animal is not made during that time, what are the problems that you will see in the animals? So the first that I will discuss is a milk fever. So milk fever occurs due to decreased calcium increase, uh, calcium intake. So if the supply of calcium is less during that window period, then the animal uh, will, that milk fever will occur. That is a hypocalcemia, less calcium in the body. This generally occurs if the animal cannot mobilize calcium from the body. So this situation is more common during the last one to three weeks before pregnancy. Um, and uh, this usually occurs, so last one to three weeks before pregnancy, what happens is 
uh, fetuses they mineralize their body so the uh, the skeleton uh, forms that uh, that last 120 to 150 window period and if the calcium is not made uh, the requirement is not made then animal will show the sign uh, symptoms of milk fever so what are the uh, symptoms of the milk fever uh, so generally animal will have a dilated pupil Dilated pupil is one of the confirmatory diagnosis, one of the sure diagnosis that vets use. Another is, I see this type of symptoms more in cattle. Head turns toward the flank. When animals will lie down in the floor and their heads will turn toward the flank. That is one of the, another symptom that you will see. Animal will start to stagger gait. So the staggering gait and muscles will tremor and animals will depress. These symptoms, uh, milk fever is an acute, acute symptom. So within one hour, that within few hours, animals that are normal, they start to see, they started to show these type of symptoms and they lie on the ground. So that are the, milk fever is something that you will see very quickly. Uh, that uh, for, um, in the evening, the animal is uh, okay, but in the morning, next day, you will see animal lying on the ground with these symptoms. So that's all of a sudden. <coughs> so uh, the best treatment is calcium gluconate. It contains calcium. Uh, bait usually, if you know how to give uh, intravenous, then it's you don't need to call bait, but if you uh, do not know how to give uh, intravenously, then veterinarians might help with that. Um, usually 50 to 80 mil of calcium gluconate intravenous and uh, 100 ml under the skin. So that's how uh, treatment. Uh, and I have seen a lot of people using CMPK injection. That is better than uh, calcium gluconate because milk fever always um, comes in uh, combination with a magnesium deficiency. And this CMPK, it contains calcium as well as magnesium. So that helps with a low magnesium level during milk fever. That is the reason when people use uh, CMPK. So better would be CMPK and also calcium gluconate will also work. Uh, for the prevention of uh, milk fever, we need to uh, make sure our animals are getting the right forage or right uh, grains during the uh, last uh, 30 day, last four weeks, six weeks of that window period, four to six weeks of that in window period, we need to make sure animals are getting right grass or forage or they are right, getting the right grain, right feed. Uh, in general, rice, sorry, cereals like rye, wheat, or triticale. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, wheat, uh, it's a hybrid of wheat. We need to make sure these these cereals and some of the grass hay, as well as corn silage, these are low in calcium. So that is the most important thing. You need to make sure animals are not getting this feed alone during the late pregnancy. Also the recommended dose for calcium to phosphorus is two is to one, but you, uh, you can feed seven is to one without any issue as long as phosphorus is adequate. We need to make sure that animal is getting the right amount of phosphorus. If the animal is getting the right amount of phosphorus, seven is to one ratio is fine. But the recommended dose is two is to one. Uh, another corn-based grain, like grain, uh, they contain low in calcium and high in phosphorus. Um, we need to make sure our animals are not getting less than one, uh, are getting more than one is to one. So don't, uh, we need to make sure animals are getting more calcium 
in compared in comparison to phosphorus like 2 is to 1 3 is to 1 7 is to 1 is fine but we, uh, we need to make sure they are not getting high phosphorus and low calcium so that inverse calcium and phosphorus ratio will cause problem even loss passer loss passer means fast growing forest highly fertilized forest high, highly fertilized grasses they are based in all nutritional qu quantity but they lack calcium so their calcium level is little bit low we need to make sure our animals during the late gestation are not getting loss passer only loss passer so we need to make sure animals are not getting just this this group of forage or grain during the late gestation because this feed contains less calcium uh, these are the best source of calcium like uh, Alpha alpha clover lespedeza they contains high calcium. They are a good source of calcium like legumes. Uh, we can provide calcium through the grain mix. You know uh, the grain that you are uh, buying from the feed store. You need to make sure that guaranteed analysis contains required amount of calcium. Um, even bone meal they include a uh, limestone like uh, limestone or calcium carbonate they make into pieces a uh, small powder and then mix in the feed as long as the animal is getting that it, it, it is good uh, another base source is dicalcium phosphate at least the the feed that uh, we buy i buy from premier one that contains dicalcium phosphate it's a good source of calcium and phosphorus uh, as long as your feed contains calcium and phosphorus, it is okay. Um, but uh, we need to make sure uh, that uh, the feed that you are buying contains calcium um, and phosphorus that the animal needs. Uh, Dr. Salinas, do we have a question for the next uh, poll? Yes. Number two, there you go. Which one is true? But you have the last option that says all the above. You're making a, a hard questions. Really, we need three, four, three more people. Okay, try to your best. Okay, there you go. Can you share? Um, Dr. Salinas, can I go now? Yep. Okay. So, um, uh, so which sentence is true? So, calcium and phosphorus requirement during the late gestation is more than the double then uh, during the dry period that is right milk fever is more common around one to three weeks before pregnancy we, especially when multiple fetuses need to mineralize the bone that is correct and corn based grains contains less calcium and high phosphorus that is also correct so the answer is all of the all of the above and uh, thank you um, most of them got the right answer and and one question is that is also for uh, use like uh, for those for sheep and, and goats is for for both of them yeah okay so uh, like the mere fever the mere fever is uh, one three weeks before is the same for sheep and goats yes even in cattle okay uh, i have seen several cases in cattle immediately before uh, 
Calvin, uh, they have a similar type of situation. Okay, uh, so another complication is ketosis. Uh, again, uh, this uh, this complication, this um, nutritional complication is more uh, common during the last four to six weeks before pregnancy. And especially in animals carrying uh, twins or triplets, um, in those animals, quadruplets, uh, in those animals, it is more common, especially. Um, and another thing is, uh, okay, uh, so now I'm getting to the question that Cherry asked a little bit uh, before. Okay, so if the animal has extremely low body condition score or extremely high body condition score, like more than four, then chances of uh, pregnancy toxemia is uh, may occur. So we would rather prefer between three and four for the body condition score of the pregnant animal before lambing or kidding. Um, the another thing is if the energy requirement of that animal during that time. So before four to six weeks before pregnancy, if the energy requirement is not met, animal will use all the glucose level in the body. And after that, they start to break down fat. So the adipose tissue, the fat tissue start to break down. And those after breaking down, they convert into ketone bodies in a normal condition. Those ketone bodies are converted uh, as energy and used by the body. But after continuous fat breakdown for the energy, that ketone bodies will accumulate in the body and more the ketone bodies, ketone is toxic to the body and uh, those ketone that, con uh, that causes pregnancy toxemia. So fat, uh, first situation is all the glucose level in the body will be utilized and uh, fat will break down to convert into glucose uh, in which ketone body is the intermediate product. After, after a lot of uh, fat will uh, dissolve, a lot of ketone will be produced as an intermediate. Once those ketone which are toxic accumulate in the body, then the pregnancy toxemia occurs. That's how pregnancy toxemia occurs. And um, you know, uh, we can talk about the difference between the symptoms of pregnancy toxemia with the milk fever, but whatever the symptom you see in the farm, it may be more or less similar. Um, during the pregnancy toxemia, animal will separate itself from the flock and they lay down. They don't want to wake up and uh, they lay down in the recumbency position. Uh, how you can find out animals that has a pregnancy toxemia, use ket uh, ketone kit. So those ketone kit can, those ketone strips, they are not expensive, they are cheap. Uh, uh, and you can test at home. Uh, that is the one of the easy way you can find um, either your animal has a pregnancy toxemia or milk fever. You know, those, those are the major two um, problems that you will see during uh, lambing or kidding, immediately like four or six weeks before lambing or kidding. Uh, for pregnancy toxemia, uh, we usually treat with a propylene glycol. Uh, we, you, we give a propylene glycol 100 ml orally for three days. You can break down the dose in the morning or in the evening, like 50-50 ml, or some people use glycerol uh, 60 ml in water and twice a day. So that's that's how we usually treat. Uh, when animals have a pregnancy toxemia, their body is acidic. Their digestive system is so much acidic because of the ketone body and a sodium bicarbonate. You can buy sodium bicarbonate in a few dollars, in one or two dollars in a Walmart. Those uh, sodium bicarbonate will help to um, neutralize the pH that will act as a buffer in the body in the body. Uh, um, so I have a question from uh, Catherine. Pro propylene glycol is only a treatment once diagnosed. Yes, that is true. So it's not a preventive. Uh, 
how can we prevent uh, i will talk about that in the next slide um sodium bi uh, sodium bicarbonate uh, thank you uh, sodium bicarbonate um, is the is used for just uh, acting as a buffer when the body is acidic during the time of pregnancy toxemia and uh, a lot of the time i use uh, neurobion neurobion is the combination of vitamin b1 b6 and b12 it's, uh, those two are just a supportive treatment that neurobion it will uh, help the nerves during the nerve uh, nerve will be a little bit relaxed they, it will be a little bit um, not a uh, uh, little bit weak stage or not uh, very active stage so during uh, um, pregnancy toxemia animal will lie down uh, so this neurobion will back up uh, makes the nerve uh, functioning so that's how um, I have a question from Brenda. BHBC also has a blood check like diabetes testing for ketosis at least for goods. Uh, Brenda, um, yes, uh, thank you for uh, that. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the kit that I use for uh, uh, diagnosing pregnancy toxemia, uh, the same kit can be used for sheep and uh, cattle so both species i believe um, you know some of those can be used for multiple species uh, how are the test strips used on use how do you get the urine on uh, uh, it may be a little bit uh, hard but if you uh, sometime uh, if i need a urine sample um, uh, you just uh, massage lightly toward the uh, side of the vagina some use they give up the they, uh, they urinate and uh, if you close the nose and sometimes they by force urinate you know these are some of the harsh technique maybe you can find a little bit better technique uh, for collection of urine samples uh, Andy, I don't know if that if I answer your question or not. That's how I used to collect urine samples from uh, sheep. Um, so for the uh, pre, uh, pre I will uh, next slide will be about prevention. Um, for pregnancy toxemia, um, adequate nutrition and high quality forage is the best option as long as they supply enough glucose. Uh, that animal need all is all pregnancy toxemia is because of the less glucose in the body if you provide nutrition and high quality for it, uh that is cured and uh, of course balance ration uh, we need to aim body condition score of three to four um, adequate feeding space sometimes that feeding space some animal get high feed then other so if we have a adequate feeding space that helps so all is about um, meeting the requirement so i already talked about milk fever and pregnancy toxemia another most important thing that you will see during the pregnancy is selenium deficiency so selenium deficiency is more common after the lambs will burn i don't know where you guys are from this uh that um, selenium deficiency areas are those in a pink, uh, pink uh, colors and those uh, and uh, light pink in a variable. Our Missouri and uh, Northern Arkansas, they they are little bit in a risk areas. Uh, so uh, pregnant that uh, selenium deficiency is due to the condition of the soil soil some of the soils as shown in the map they contains less selenium in the soil that means less selenium in the forage or grass the animals graze and that will result less selenium in the pregnant animal vitamin e is independent of the soil it's just a, when selenium and vitamin e use are used together it will maximize each other's effect. So selenium deficiency, you will see in this type of newly born uh, kids or lamb. Kids are more susceptible to selenium deficiency because they 
need little bit more than lamb. Lamb are less susceptible than kids. And two major uh, symptoms that you will see in those animals are um, their legs are bent, their muscles are uh, stiff, they feel pain during walking, they, uh, they act like a, they, uh, like a trembling. They, you can easily uh, diagnose selenium deficiency lamps and kids because of their bent legs, toes, and their stiff muscles. They, they tremble and you know, you will see this is an easy thing, uh, symptoms and you will see this time symptoms a lot. And another symptom is cardiac uh, muscle damage that heart failed. Um, kids will, uh, around three to four weeks, they are more affected with a selenium deficiency. And you will see these symptoms more in kids. Uh, how we can uh, prevent selenium deficiency? Uh, Throughout my life, I, I used to inject Bose, that's a selenium plus vitamin E injection. Those injections are available and, you know, uh, while preparing this slide, I read uh, an article from Michigan State. And in Michigan uh, State, uh, their extension group, they, um, they rather prefer adding sel selenium in the feed rather than the injection. So their best option would be there, uh, according to them, a better include selenium in the feed rather than injecting selenium. So if you buy, if you don't want to inject, there is an option of uh, cell inclusion, uh, in a selenium included feed in the mineral, uh, in selenium included in the mineral mix, you can, uh, look for those and see if how much animal need and whether those uh, meet then in general uh, they meet the requirement um, and uh, uh, a Bose injection is another option. So uh, vaginal prolapse uh, I have uh, 15 more minutes to go so I will quick uh, quickly go uh, with what I have remaining. Uh, this is one of the pictures that I took uh, from the Facebook a uh, few days ago while preparing these slides. Uh, vaginal prolapse is not very common, but you will at least see in some of your animals like 1%, 2%, um, maximum 5% in your flock. Um, not, not, not very common, um, you know. And uh, it occurs due to pushing out of that... Uh, Vagina uh, when uh, when they are pregnant, it usually occurs during the last uh, uh, last few weeks before the pregnancy, uh, and um, this is uh, due to if the animal cannot get the right amount of nutrition when the body condition is score is very high, and when they don't get the enough uh, exercise, and when their diet contains high fiber diet and then if there are many fetuses in the utero, uterus, if there are many fetus in the animal, if the animal is experience, experiencing hypercalcemia, lameness, then this type of situations will occur. Even if some of these cases are like a genetic, that heredity, that transfer uh, transfers. And if now, if that animal has a vaginal prolapse, very high chance that next uh, lambing or kidding that same animal will have same problem. It's a recurring type of thing. So what we do is, these are the two pictures that I took from the premier one. Uh, they have two things. One is a spoon uh, that you insert inside the vagina and another is harness that retains that uh, uh, retainer that um, that controls those retainer. This is a uh, if you have a vaginal prolapse, first thing is wash that outside with soap water. Insert inside. If that uh, vaginal prolapse is at the preliminary stage, like a small part coming out, then insert uh, insert with a retainer. Insert retainer and apply harness. If that uh, the 
the uh, the part that coming out is more is a big amount just apply retainer and um, uh, sorry apply harness only so the if the part is big uh, part coming out apply harness only no uh, retainer if the outside part coming uh, that vaginal uh, prolapse is small apply retainer and then harness so um, but if you apply a remove uh, after applying uh, that uh, retainer, plastic retainer, take out that retainer after two or three days and just leave the harness. That's how I, I usually do. And um, the, uh, if the case is too much complicated, if you cannot do by all by yourself, uh, call bait sometime. If that is too much complicated, just um, baits, call baits and they apply suture. Suture need to be removed after uh, lambing or kidding, and it's a little bit complicated case, and it's a reoccurring case. So, best thing is sell that animal after it lambs or um, you know, kid. Uh, another thing is vaccination. Um, four to six weeks uh, before pregnancy, uh, need to vaccinate with a C and uh, T vaccine. So, this is the one of the compulsory vaccine that we use in our lamb. In, in our pregnant uh, pregnant sheep and goat, uh, need to uh, vaccinate at least five six weeks before uh, before uh, expected uh, lambing or kidding. Uh, the newborn animal, newborn kid or lamb, they get antibody from the colostrum of the anim pregnant animal, and for five to six days, that lamb, newly born lamb or kid is safe. But after six weeks, revaccinate in six weeks. That uh, uh, sorry, vaccinate those newborn lambs or kids in six weeks, and again in twelve weeks. So two vaccines for the kids, and vaccinate uh, pregnant animal before lambing or kidding. So vaccinate dam or you do is or use before kidding or lambing. That is one part. The second is vaccinate lamb or kid in six to eight weeks and re-vaccinate in 10 to 12 weeks. So kids twice, pregnant animal once before lambing or kidding. Uh, another big issue you will uh, generally have in your farm is worm, worm control. During uh, pregnancy, um, immediately before uh, lambing, like one or two weeks before lambing or kidding and uh, few weeks, like two, three, four weeks uh, after lambing or kidding, uh, the pregnant animal loses uh, immunity during that uh, stress. And they start to, the internal worms inside the body start to multiply in that stress. Generally, uh, the larvae is in the, inside the animal are in the hyper uh, hyperbiotic stress. That is means inactive stress because of the animal, pregnant animals, uh, because of the immunity, animals, larvae of the parasites inside the animal are inactive stress. But due to the stress, pregnancy stress, before or after lambing or kidding, animal, that larvae, that parasites inside the animal body start to multiply. <coughs> it starts to become active. They convert from larva to adult. It start to release egg. In order to kill those uh, larvae or in order to kill those parasites, ibumac and cydectin, these two are the most um, active uh, dewormers that can kill a larvae stage as well as adult stage worms inside the body. And uh, you know, uh, while uh, deworming, I used to deworm at the same time when we applied CDT vaccine deworming so those two can be, go together even i used to inject uh, selenium uh, vaccine Bose vaccine at the same time of ctt vaccine and then deworming i used to do three things at a time because we don't want to bring animals all the time in the barn so that i use for the pregnant animal these three two uh, two vaccination and one deworming should be okay and you know, a lot of people they prefer deworming if they see more eggs. You know, that's fine. 
uh, additional recommendation that's especially apply for wool breed um, around in Missouri or in the south we pretty much have hair sheep but if you are from the area with the wool sheep then it will be good to share wool uh, wool sheep um, before uh, like 30 to 60 days before uh, lambing or uh, lambing that will help to blood flow in that pregnant animal and this is the one of the conclusion from the research that healthier animal or lambs will be born. With that is the last slide. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask me in the chat. Or uh, we have one more question. Do we have an, one more question, Doctor Salnas? Yes. Okay. Uh, we have la last question, and then I will be more than happy to answer questions. Which is true. I think most of the people have an answer. Probably two, three more people. Um, yeah, so the which of these is true? So if the energy requirement is not met by the feed intake, um, doids or you will break down her own fat tissue. That is correct. At first, they will utilize all the glucose from the body. And if it is still deficient, they would start to break down fat. And during the fat breakdown, toxic ketone body will produce. So that is the reason we call pregnancy toxemia or ketosis. Uh, selenium combined with the vitamin E increases its other's efficacy. So that is true. If we give just selenium, it may be less active, but less product, less effective. But if we combine selenium with the vitamin E, vitamin E will boost up the effect of selenium. Vaccinate you with a CDT vaccine after the pregnancy? Answer is no because CDT vaccine has to be uh, vaccinated pregnant animal before the pregnancy because that immunity, that colostrum that passes from uh, pregnant animal to the kid or lamb immediately after the birth. So that they need to get uh, those uh, CDT vaccine from the colostrum to the newborn one. Uh, that is not true. So. Uh, Obviously, A and B are true, and C is not true. With this, uh, I have finished my presentation. I would be more than happy to answer if you have any questions. Uh, Andy, uh, so the pregnant use should be duum regardless of Maza score. Um, that thing I would not say. Uh, that's uh, I would. Uh, I would rather do fecal account, but you know, you can still give uh, copper oxide uh, wire particles. That's how I I used to uh, treat. Uh, so during uh, when you you can what you can do is Hamasa score. If you do not have that uh, big, uh, no, uh, you you are at Hamasa score. Uh, do FAMASA score, if you think that that is less and uh, anemic, uh, then only a DWAM. I would rather prefer a DWAM on the base of FAMASA. Okay. Uh, anybody has another question? Uh, um, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, uh, we have been tracking uh, the assistance of all of you. So pretty, pretty soon we are going to uh, to send uh, the list to you just to see if you lost any of the events. So to, to get the certificate uh, soon and some of the books that we are going to send uh, for those ones that complete, complete uh, the certificate. So we, we want to be sure. For those ones that uh, miss any of the webinars, we are trying to upload 
I am sorry that in the last two, three, I haven't had time to edit the videos and uh, upload them, but we are going to have all of them. So in the, in the way that you can watch it, and the way that we are going to see that you watch it is uh, for you just to watch it and to make some comments on some questions. Like uh, we are going to ask to each one of you a story of how you like it and what you have learned uh, by the end of the of the certificate. Because uh, uh, the the ones that are paying for these certificates. Uh, that is risk management uh, is a USDA agency uh, is asking us uh, to share with them anonymous uh, uh, conversations about stories about what you can learn. So we appreciate very much later on when we are going to ask you about that. So our next speaker, uh, Dr. Acharya, who will be and when? Uh, so far, uh, Miss Linda, um, uh, Coffee would be our next speaker uh, if everything goes okay. And then on the 4th of March, we have a, a guardian dog uh, and uh, that would be from extension specialist Jill from uh, Texas, uh, Texas a and University. Yeah. Okay, so I will be sending information for even, I sent already information from the the last two that are the, the, the two that we are going to have to end in this webinar. And also we are going to have another certificate, uh, a little bit uh, different um, during June that will be in person at Sidalia, Missouri in the GOT Expo. So I will be sending the information for that one. That will be the last two days of May, three days of May and the first day of June at Sidalia, Missouri. Uh, thank you very much and uh, take care. Thank you for being with us. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you.